tonight. I just do want to express my frustration in the process. A frustrated mother storms out of a coroner's inquest into the death of her teen son. Also, an American family is infected with muscle worms after eating undercooked bear meat from Saskatchewan. Plus, we introduce you to an 11-year-old accordion player. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Tuesday, May 28th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for watching. The inquest into the death of 14-year-old Haven Dubois continued in Regina this morning. Since his death in 2015, his mother, Rochelle Dubois, has insisted there's more to the story. Alexander Kwan brings us the latest. It was another emotional day at the coroner's inquest into the death of Haven Dubois. A pathologist walked the jury through his autopsy report, testifying that Haven died as a result of an accidental drowning at a creek in the east end of Regina in 2015. At one point, Haven's mother, Rochelle, stormed out of the proceedings. That came after the pathologist testified that he found no cuts or scratches on Haven's face, something that Rochelle testified she saw after Haven's death. Yesterday, the lawyers representing the family told media why Rochelle may be feeling so frustrated. Typically, these processes uh, are not very satisfactory. The purview of the jury is very limited, um, but it is there are important questions that need to be answered. Rochelle did return to the room a short time later. I still feel like this is a one-sided um, decision-making process. Um, I am deep. I have more questions, I guess, after hearing what the pathologist had to say. Um, it leaves me with more questions than answers. I'm frustrated because I feel like some of the key players aren't at the table. I feel like there should have been more people called to witness that aren't called to be here to answer some of the questions regarding um, the medical pieces of the situation. The jury also heard from Haven's friend group who testified that they had been smoking pot with Haven in the hours leading up to his death. They also recounted how Haven appeared to have a panic attack afterwards and then ran off down the road. A toxicology report detected a small amount of marijuana in Haven's system, but it did not make clear how Haven could have reacted to those drugs. The inquiry is expected to last until Thursday. 13 witnesses are expected to testify. The jury will not determine guilt, but they will determine the cause of death. They could also make recommendations on how similar deaths could be avoided in the future. Alexander Kwan, CBC News, Regina. We're learning more today about the biometric system that Regina police are using to monitor people in their jail cells. Staff Sergeant Pierre Beauchene says along with Edmonton, the force is among the first in Canada to use the technology. It's a radar-based system that senses movement and sends monitor and sends monitor heart rate and respiration rates. It's installed in 10 of 34 cells right now and has already alerted police about three separate incidents. The goal is to have the technology equipped in all of the cells. When you look at uh, the indicators of the biometric monitoring or what we are looking for, uh, it could be someone with gross in intoxication, it could be someone with a drug overdose, it could be someone with uh, prior health risks, um, it could be uh, suicidal, so someone, it would notify us of a, a suicide attempt, so, or a combination thereof. So drugs, uh, severe intoxication, uh, medical uh, history, or suicide. The Regina Police Service says the total cost for the units is about $3,700 per cell. Then it's $99 a month per unit for the monitoring. The opposition NDP wants a legislative committee to appoint an investigator to look into allegations made by the Speaker. Opposition NDP MLA Mira Conway sent a letter to Speaker Randy Weeks today. It's Weeks' responsibility to call for a committee to meet. Conway has asked Weeks to convene the House Services Committee. She says it should appoint an investigator who would explore allegations of bullying and harassment made by Weeks against government members and staff. The House Services Committee has the authority to appoint an independent investigator 
set the rules and parameters of any investigation and give the investigator subpoena powers, meaning that just like in a court of law, witnesses could be compelled to testify under oath and give evidence at official hearings. Conway says Weeks could call the committee and it could agree to the request, or a majority of Saskatchewan Party MLAs on the committee could vote any next steps down. Premier Mo has said if there is any in type of investigation, he will not be requesting one. An American family became infected with muscle worms after eating undercooked bear meat from northern Saskatchewan. The details were made public in a new report published by the United States Public Health Agency. Pratush Dayal has more. Undercooked bear meat left an American family infected with muscle worms after a hunting trip to Saskatchewan. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says nine family members from three states, Arizona, Minnesota and South Dakota, had attended a family gathering where they shared kebabs of black bear meat that had been harvested by one of the family members in northern Saskatchewan. So what went wrong? The meat was infected with trichinella larvae. It's a muscle-dwelling roundworm. It's unfortunate but unsurprising. Trichinella is commonly found in bears and other wildlife. Cooking the meat at a high heat can kill the larvae, but... Bear meat is really good meat. It's often dark purple in color. And so if you're not used to cooking bear meat, it can be hard to judge when it's done or not done. That's exactly what the report says. The meat was undercooked, but also the family believed freezing the bear meat would kill off the parasites. It doesn't. Freezing just shouldn't be considered a reliable way to kill parasites in bear meat. The only way to be sure that bear meat is safe to consume is to cook it very, very thoroughly. And really, the, the way to be absolutely sure is test the interior temperature with a meat thermometer. I spoke to an expert who says this disease pops up every couple of years associated with bear meat, usually with tourists. She says indigenous people who harvest wild animals know that the meat has to be cooked well. We've had massive outbreaks in France, for example, associated with bear meat from Canada. Again, just because people didn't necessarily have that protective knowledge. Common symptoms include muscle aches and fever, but the larvae could travel through the body and even end up in the eyes or brain. It loves muscle, um, and so it often ends up in skeletal muscle, like your arms and legs. But where it really shows severe problems is if it gets in the heart, uh, it can cause cardiac disease. Luckily, in this case, the family got the medical help before it could get that bad. Pratish Dayal, CBC News, Saskatoon. Saskatchewan Métis people are a step closer to self-government. A treaty draft developed by Métis Nation Saskatchewan could go to members for a vote as early as this fall. We're hoping, of course, that Canada will stick to their obligation to sign a document that is nation to nation, that fulfills uh, the agreements that we have already signed. Uh, and I think we have a firm commitment from Canada to do that. And so we just need them to live up to their constitutional obligations. And so we're excited. This is our moment as a community. This is our moment for our citizens. This is our moment for our children and our grandchildren and our future grandchildren. If Ottawa signs on, the treaty establishes the political organization as Indigenous government. The treaty document is not yet public. Leclerc says it would give Métis the power to develop their own laws and services. Métis Nation Saskatchewan will be sharing treaty details with members at forums over the summer. With both preseason games in the books, the Rough Riders are relying on themselves to keep up intensity ahead of final cutdowns at the end of training camp this week. The big one is second string quarterback. Without a game to help make a final decision this week, the coaching staff will rely on camp performance to decide who will back up Trevor Harris. All four quarterbacks, Jack Cohn, Mason Fine, Shea Patterson and Antonio Pipkin are battling for the coveted spot. Harris says he's not just watching this play out, he's trying to be helpful. Making sure that they feel good about uh, where they're at mentally when they step on the field and if they have any questions, but they're all adults and they're professionals, you know, they've done and amazing things, a lot of them much more than me, you know, to get to this position, like with Shea playing at Michigan and Jack playing at Wisconsin-Notre Dame and Mason setting every passing record ever known and 
Uh, obviously, Pip, you know, coming from a small school and being in the league for eight years now. So, like, these guys know what they're doing. They're awesome, and uh, we're all kind of learning together. I think at any position, but, you know, certainly that one, um, when the competition is there, you're going you're gonna to get the pressure and the, the best out of anybody. And at that position, uh, you know, it's naturally just anointed on them, the, you know, the pressure to perform. So uh, the fact that we can mimic that in, in camp, uh, I think, is a great benefit for, for our organization. Final cut down day is the end of camp June 1st. Today, the team released national linebacker Matt Dean and American defensive back Holton Hill. The Riders will be back on the road for their first regular season game. That is Saturday, June 8th in Edmonton. A tour today at the LED wall over at the soundstage in Regina. A chance to see the first virtual production there in action. You guys kind of like look on the wall, move, and like manipulate. The screen. Using the wall right now is a film production called Hostile Takeover. It's an action thriller starring American actor and martial artist Michael J. White and Saskatoon raised Amy Stolte. They're using the digital canvas to allow filmmakers to create limitless settings. Parks, Culture and Sports Minister Laura Ross says this should help our economy and film sector. Creative Saskatchewan invested $3.3 million into the movie. It's estimated that will generate about $14 million in economic spinoff, creating almost 150 jobs. Oh, Bloom's so beautiful, you'd want to take a picture or maybe paint one. These women settled in on this gorgeous day in Saskatoon at Boffin's Public Gardens at USASC to do some painting. And they picked a good day for it because if the forecast holds, there could be some thunderstorms in their future. Ethan will have the forecast after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Lots of us took piano lessons as kids, but fewer children pick up the accordion. Never mind sing and play Polish folk music. This week we have an ongoing series featuring the people behind Mosaic this year. And we stop by the Polish Hall in Regina to chat with a young accordion player who's embracing his family's culture. <laughs> Hi, my name is Camille and I'm 11 years old. Uh, I started playing accordion because my dad started playing accordion and I kind of wanted to learn because I've always played piano and to like open the bellows to make music. So it's like more cooler than a, um, a piano. It's not that really popular and I know that nobody else would probably do it. My name is Daniel Smella and I'm the, uh, Camille Smella's father. So my mom was, uh, was born and raised in Poland. Uh, she moved over here in the late 70s, right? So uh, that Polish tradition's always kind of been, you know, inbred in me. I mean, every, you know, we speak Polish at home. We meet with the Polish community, sort of things. So very involved back in the day with the Polish community. And just from there, just being involved with Polish dancing and, and went to Polish school and, and uh, just that just helped foster that tradition, that culture. <laughs> I started dancing because all my, my parents did it and my sister was doing it. I started when I was um, four, I'm pretty sure, and I've been dancing for like seven years almost. And I guess it's like, I guess it's fun performing and stuff. The practices are boring. Uh, I guess because like when I dance, it like, it like shows my culture when I dance because all the like, the, uh, like the songs and the beat and like the, footwork and stuff. The show was still going on because I had a break. So then I started playing It was and it was kind of fun. And then when people would leave, they would always see me playing. They said like, good job. And I guess they're like proud of me. Well, I guess it's part of my culture and it makes me proud. It means a lot. Um, it's nice to see that my, my children, my, my son and my daughter, uh, will, will continue to dance in Polish dancing and see that they're enjoying it. And I'm hoping that one day that they'll be able to go through the same experience as I did, you know, and travel uh, across the world and, and dance in different festivals and, and develop those friendships and, and just upkeep their, their culture and maybe one day pass it down to their children. The weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln. Truck time is on now.
You know, Ethan, you're musical. If there is a time to confess an accordion talent, this would be it. You know, I can't do it because those things require, like, physical strength, too, right? So He's props 11. To, props to Camille because he needs the musical talent and he needs the physical stamina to do that as well. That's great. Well, now moving from music into the weather, uh, which is what, yes, I am here to talk about, in fact. And we have some nice uh, temperatures today at National Hotspot, actually, at Rosetown today, getting to 27 degrees. Collins Bay, uh, this is your warmest temperature all year so far. And uh, specifically through south and central Saskatchewan is where we've seen temperatures today get into those upper 20s. Still a little bit cool, though, as you work your way eastward near 20 on the eastern side uh, of the province. But we've really kind of had this gradual start to spring. And these numbers really show that. In Saskatoon, we get about 12 or 13 days in May where the temperature gets above 20 degrees. We've only had seven of those days this May. Compare that to last May, we had 22 days. And uh, in Regina, very similar picture. Uh, 22 days in May of uh, last year. We see about 12 to 13 days above 20 degrees in May as well. We've had nine so far, just a couple more days uh, in the month to go. Now, along with this uh, warm air, we've also seen some nice clear skies as well. High pressure out in Manitoba keeping things uh, nice and sunny for the most part. That is about to change though as we go through these next 24 hours. We'll walk you through it. We have this low pressure system and an associated cold front which is not only going to drop temperatures but it's also going to bring some thunderstorms through late tomorrow morning and early tomorrow afternoon in parts of west central and southwestern Saskatchewan. Saskatoon will include you in that risk. And then as we get later in the day, that front shifts further eastward and it's Regina, Yorkton, Weyburn, Estevan, where we have the risk of those storms. After that moves out, Thursday, we're just left with showers and cloudy conditions and much cooler as well. Things starting to clear out for Friday, but the north likely still going to be seeing some rain. So the most, uh, the highest risk, I guess I should say, for severe weather is kind of in an area of Regina and southeastward. And it's here uh, where we could see, uh, you know, some gusts in excess of 100 kilometers an hour with some storms and maybe some nickel to ping pong ball sized hail, in addition to some uh, heavy rain. And again, this is largely dependent on uh, if we see thunderstorm activity come to fruition, but some low Local amounts 20 to 30 millimeters are possible with heavier pockets of rain. Otherwise, it's a general 5 to 10 millimeters likely over this next day or so. And the winds are really going to start picking up as we go through these next couple of days. Tomorrow and Thursday, look for gusts uh, 50, maybe 60, especially in the southern half of the province. The north should kind of be escaping the worst of the winds, I think. So Regina, late day thunderstorms with that wind. Nice temperatures until the cold front comes along Thursday and knocks us down of over 10 degrees, down to just 14 degrees. But things will improve on the other side of this, including in Saskatoon, where, again, after we get through these next couple of days here, temperatures rebound into the 20s with some uh, nice conditions. So first kind of real active weather day, a severe weather day for us in the eastern part of the province, Sam. Hey, now that it's wet out there, it, it can be active. It's That's, okay. Less worried about the drought. That is true, yes. All right. Thanks, Ethan. You're welcome. Oh, it was a big day for fans of Mexican-inspired fast food. Taco Bell has returned to the Queen City, and some people were so excited that they lined up to be first in the door at 4.30 this morning, even though it didn't open until 10.30. You will remember Taco Bell was once here as part of a KFC franchise. The new franchise company called Redberry, who is opening the Regina location, also recently acquired two Taco Bell locations in Saskatoon. We'll be back after the break. For the first time in the history of the Ontario Legislature, it's allowed the official use of a language other than English or French. New Democrat MPP Sol Mamakwa addressed the chamber in his language of OG Cree today. It was translated and transcribed into the official record. The history that has removed the children from our ways of life, sometimes even Soap was used to wash their mouth for speaking their Anshinimoan Oji Cree language. They were punished for speaking their own language. Mamakwa represents the community of Kingfisher Lake, First Nation in Northern Ontario. Family and friends turned out to watch the historic event. He says it's important because Indigenous people are losing their languages. Financially troubled seafood restaurant Red Lobster Canada 
is coming under the same bankruptcy protection as its counterparts in the states. A lawyer for the Canadian arm of the company made the request in an Ontario courtroom today. Red Lobster in the U.S. is under Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Executives there have told the courts the company intends to sell most or all of its assets. Red Lobster Canada has about 2,000 employees and operates 27 restaurants in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba and Ontario. And Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. Warm and a little bit windy is uh, the story here in Regina tonight, but a nice warm temperature of 14 degrees at midnight. Watch those winds because they're going to pick up tomorrow morning even more. Southeast gusting to 60 by the time you head out the door. Still sunny, though. It's into the afternoon, though. We'll have to watch because uh, by noon, things will probably be uh, mostly sunny still, but there is a chance of some severe storms as we get a little bit later into the day. For Saskatoon, uh, another warm one for you as well overnight tonight. Similar winds, not uh, quite as strong as Regina. Not going to change too much temperature-wise by the morning. And again, you have a chance of some showers and storms late morning, early afternoon. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye uh, to the skies tomorrow, Sam. Definitely. Thanks, Ethan. You're welcome. And before we leave you tonight, a Saskatchewan man is still on a high after joining the ranks of mountain climbers from our province who've reached the peak of Mount Everest. Landry Warnett summited Mount Everest earlier this month. I think I've always been drawn to like looking for an adventure, right? And that's something that I wanted at this point in my life. I wanted to have that opportunity, right? To go to Everest during the climbing season, meet people from around the world, and then have a shot to try to climb the, the tallest mountain. And adventure-wise, it didn't disappoint. A big thing to climbing Everest is cardio, right? So you're climbing for, you know, between 8 to 12 hours a day, multiple days on end. So I was in pretty good shape come January of this year. I came back to Canada and I really focused on my training then, strength training in the gym, cardio, and then climbing specific training. It was, on the one hand, pretty scary. Like, on the other, uh, you feel really happy, obviously. You feel relieved that, you know, your two-month expedition has resulted in you hitting the summit. But you also realize, like, the climb's not done until you descend. I have photos and videos of me holding the Saskatchewan flag. <laughs> At the okay. summit, what you'll see is uh, prayer flags. So it's uh, Nepal's, uh, it's just their way of honoring the mountain. There's a lot of things that we do in our life that is dangerous. You know, Everest, the risk is really highlighted internationally when people die. But uh, I obviously, I felt that it was, it was a risk I was willing to take. And that's it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask or subscribe to our YouTube channel or download the CBC News app. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.